Friday. It's really good. So let's stand to our feet and let's worship the Lord and give him some of the glory that he deserves. before you you take us as we are but God I thank you for your grace because through that we're not going to be who we are anymore we're going to be sanctified by you we're going to be more like you you're going to help us on our way becoming more like you Lord Jesus Louder than every lie 
my sword in every fight the truth will chase away the night your name is power over darkness freedom for the captives mercy for the broken and the hopeless your name is faithful in the battle glory in the struggle mighty won't let us down or fail us your name is power
Peter is denying. But they don't know that Sundays are coming. It's Friday. The Romans beat my Jesus. They roll him in scar. They crown him with thorn. But they don't know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. See Jesus walking to Calvary. His blood dripping. His body stumbling. And his spirits burning. But you see, it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The world's winning. People are sinning. And evil's grinning. It's Friday. The soldiers nailed my Savior's hands to the cross. They nailed my Savior's feet to the cross. And then they raised him up next to criminals. It's Friday. But let me tell you something. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are questioning what has happened to their king. And the Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved. But they don't know. It's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. is buried. A soldier stands God and a rock is rolled into place. But it's Friday. It is only Friday. Sunday is a cup. The first is obvious. From this day, 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on a cross at Calvary. And as horrible as it was, he was not the first and nor would he be the last person to die on a cross at Calvary. Unlike the two thieves that stood beside him, that were crucified beside Jesus, he was not given the death penalty for some hideous crime. He was given the death penalty out of jealousy and envy. And at any time, he could have caught an angel from heaven and stop the whole thing from happening. And, but, but Jesus died on that cross because God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son to give up his life so that we could have a life. Thanks, well, the second reason we drink from the cup and eat from the bread is because on Sunday, Jesus rose from the dead. And if you're in Christ Jesus, the day will come when you too will rise from the dead. According to statistics, the mortality, the mortality rate of humanity is still at 100%. It's just if you're in Christ Jesus, death will not be your final word. The final word you will hear is, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter the joy that I have awaiting you. Thanks, it was Friday, and Jesus knew what was about to transpire. He knew that Judas would betray him for 30 pieces of silver. Sadly, People today are still betraying the Lord for a whole lot less. For 30 pieces of silver, they could buy a piece of land. Your people betray the Lord for a whole lot less today. Jesus knew the type of death that awaited him. He knew that every sin of every rapist and every murder and every adulterer and every wife basher and every liar, and we're all liars to some degree, and every cheater and every seducer was to be about to be placed on his soul. He knew that, so he took a piece of bread, and he used the bread to remind us 
that Sunday was coming. And when he took it, he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. Let us eat this morning in remembrance of Christ's sacrifice. A little later, Jesus took some fruit of the grape, fruit of the vine, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Drink all of it. Under the old covenant, on this day, a couple of thousand years ago, thousands of animals were sacrificed in a temple. It was, they were sacrificed to deal with the sin issue. And I think about it, I go, I don't keep my own commandments, let alone God's commands. And sin would separate me from God. But they, the problem with the old covenant, the killing of the animals, it wasn't dealing with the sin. All it was doing was killing animals. So the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, laid down his life for all of humanity. And he said, this cup represents my blood that is going to be shed for you. Let us drink together. Lord God, we thank you that your son, the perfect Passover lamb, when his blood was shed, that blood will never lose its power. It will always wipe out the foulest sin. And even sins that we might just call little sins, it wipes them out. I thank you that you rose again. You conquered death. And because you live, we too can live in you. Amen. We're going to sing a different song now. If you know it, join in. If you don't, just have a listen to the words. I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time Sin separated The breach was far too wide But from the dark side of the chasm You held me in your side So you made a way Across the great divide Left behind Heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owe. You broke my chains, freed my soul for the first time. I Darkness into 
by our Father through her blood, the blood. There is nothing stronger on the one who work the power of the blood, the blood that calls the sons and joys. Ransomed by our Father through the blood, the blood. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you. You have saved my life Brought me from the darkness Into glorious light Welcome, Simon. Let's just pray. Lord, we thank you for this day and that we come together. We want to take a moment to remember that it is just Friday. We know Sunday is coming, but for a moment, Lord God, we want to stand in your presence. Consider what Friday means for each and every one of us. That for a moment, personally, we think of what Friday means to us. What your death means to each and every one of us. What you have given to us what you have enabled us to do, the places that you have moved us out of, the sin that you have removed from us. And Lord God, we just take a moment to just contemplate where we would be if you had not done what you had done. And Lord God, we just breathe in your presence. We thank you for your sacrifice. We remember, Lord God, what you have done and what you were doing on this particular day and what that means to each and every one of us. And we thank you for that in your mighty name. Amen. Welcome to church, everybody. It's great to see you here with us today. And um, if you're visiting, we give you a special welcome. Uh, always good to come out on Easter Friday and just spend some time together in, a, in our remembrance of, of him. So we do welcome you particularly today. I only got just a couple of um, announcements and really, I mean, the kids are in church with us today. It's great to have them with us. Um, there is a, a colouring competition going on, so if any of the kids uh, missed out on getting that, then please um, grab that from the information desk. Um, do that, hand that in today. We're actually going to have a, a judge of, of the colouring that's been done and there'll be prizes handed out on Sunday. So that'll bring you back for Sunday as well. We've got different age group. There's the under fives, there's the fives to tens and ten years plus. So there's no upper limit on that. So go hard, everybody. Okay. Keen. Mo's keen. going. Okay. <laughs> Mo's always keen for a prize. Alana's already in the midst of hers. So, um, yeah, so don't forget, write your name on your colouring and, uh, and hand that in. Another little guy making a run for it. Okay. So, um, so be part of that, kids, and, um, and have a great time with us this morning. As we know, Sunday's coming. And we're here again, 9 o'clock on Sunday, so please join with us for Resurrection Sunday service, and that will be a wonderful time uh, for us to come together. There will be an Easter egg hunt after the service, so um, it says, for the kids, Pastor Brooker. <laughs> Wayne's in it, he's, he's doing it tough at the moment, because having made that statement about his diet, he's just constantly being watched Everything that passes his lips is being analysed. 
and I think it will be the last time that he makes that sort of confession uh, from the pulpit. But um, Wayne's very pleased and he's happy for people to come up and hold him accountable at any time. So, um, so please do that. Okay, so Easter egg hunt on Sunday. Come with us. A wonderful day, Resurrection Sunday. We're going to rejoice big time. So please be with us for that. Um, we will take up an offering today um, in case people are not here on Sunday. So we know that you can give online, but we will also be handing the bags around this morning as well. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we can continue our worship to you this morning. We want to give our tithes and offerings. Lord, we thank you for your generosity and for your provision. Uh, and Lord God, it's an honour that we can just give back a little something of that which you have blessed us with. So Lord, we pray that, that um, this offering is blessed, that you multiply it, enable us to do a great work for your kingdom. I pray your blessing upon each and every household represented. Lord God, that your provision uh, will be available and made for each home represented. Um, bless people, I pray. And we thank you, Lord, that we can worship like this in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.
again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I know it's not much I'm nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, would you anoint every word that um, you're going to speak through Pastor Peter. God, let it be lifted up, lifting us up, encouraging us, blessing us, correcting us. God. Speak. Well, good morning. Grab your seat. Good Friday. We're honoured that you'd choose to spend it with us and bring glory to God on, on the day of today that we get to walk through the story and, and revisit what Jesus Christ did for us um, so many years ago. Um, let me just get set up and we'll get into it because it's such a pleasure to... Um, be part of the telling of the story and to see what God has to say for us as a church in this time. And one of the things as I was walking through the story and, and reading it um, over the weeks was something that God really impressed on my heart was the humanity of Jesus. And it's not something we talk about too much. We have it in our, our church faith and we'll have it in our statement of faith that Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. And sometimes that becomes a bit confusing and we, we don't know what that means. But if you're anything like me, you read through the stories of Jesus, his teachings, his miracles, everything he does. And there's this thought in the back of your mind that goes, yeah, but he's God. He walks on water. Yeah, but he's God. Or he heals someone. Yeah, but he's God. He dies on the cross and is raised again by the power of God. And we know it and we admit it and we say, yeah, but he's God. And we... Almost unknowingly, we dismiss his humanity. We dismiss what he actually suffered through and went through on our behalf. So I want to start by, by reading out of Philippians. I want to show this to you, how human Jesus was, the extent of his humanity. So we read in Philippians that we, we must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. He didn't think of his divinity as something to cling to. He saw something more valuable than his divinity. What could that possibly be? What could possibly be more valuable than having eternity in heaven with God the Father, having immortality, having all the power in the world of the universe, he looked at that and said, I've got something that's more precious, more valuable. I've got something that's worth giving all that up. He was born as a vulnerable baby, as a human mortal baby, this God of ours, Christ Jesus. He surrendered it all. And not only that, the powers that he had on earth was the same as the access that we have. He was only enabled access through the power of the Holy Spirit, through his connection to God. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. It says, So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. To what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. I think it even escapes us that Jesus had the option to sin. It might even sound blasphemous that Jesus could have sinned. It would make the temptations meaningless if he didn't have that option. It would make his endurance meaningless if he couldn't have fallen into the sin. Jesus could have sinned. I think one of the greatest miracles that we often skip over is that he lived for 33 years on this earth, didn't sin once. I can't last a day. Jesus did it for 33 years. And again, we go, yeah, but he's God. Okay, he had divine nature. He was born of God. But he suffered the exact same temptations. 
the exact same trials. He experienced it exactly as we do, yet he was perfect. And I've titled today's message, One of Us, because I look at the the scene of the cross. Jesus died as a criminal, that the Bible says he was cursed on a tree. He died beside two other criminals, just like an everyday person. He was thrown in the midst of normal humanity, born as a human to us. And when we remove this thought of, yeah, but he's God and he was supposed to do it, he had a mission, and we remember that he was a human, just like us. He surrendered his divinity for us. It brings so much more power to realize this human, Jesus, sacrificed all his divinity, his status with God, his place in heaven. He sacrificed that for me. What am I going to do with that? And we read... In Philippians, uh, again, we read the end of that passage, verses 8 to 11. It says, He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I want to highlight Jesus' humility. Even when he was on earth, he was saying, I don't speak in my own authority. Everything you hear me say, I hear from the Father. So even in his practice of his day-to-day, his teachings, his miracles, it was all in accordance to God. Philippians is telling us he was obedient even unto death. Again, we dismiss the fact that Jesus could have turned around and said, no God, I don't want to do this. I'm out. Humanity can save themselves. God, call me back to heaven, please. Skip the death and, the, and all the suffering, please. I want to come home. We, we think of that as it's not an option. But Jesus purposely endured it. Jesus purposely suffered so that we could have our salvation, so that we could have eternal life. And we look at the humility of God, of Jesus to God. It is so strong. We see it in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he's praying with with his disciples. And as he's on his knees to God, he's crying out to God, like any human would, please don't let me go through this. Please, if there's any other way, please let there be another way, God. But in that humility, Jesus, the Son of God, who is from heaven, says to his Father, but I will endure it, I will do it if it's your will. I will submit myself to you. I can't imagine having the status that Jesus had, surrendering it, and then being obedient to the cross, knowing what was coming, knowing full well the suffering ahead of us. I I want you this morning to place yourself in Jesus' shoes. From from the moment he's praying to God, knowing what's coming, to when the guards are coming to get him, and Peter's chopping a guy's ear off. How would you be feeling like, yes, we got one in? Before they take me away, at least you guys got hurt in the process. But what does Jesus do? He says, stop. He says, stop. He heals the guy's ear. He's still compassionate every step of the way. He holds his tongue. He doesn't call down fire from heaven. He doesn't send his angels. He actually turns to Peter and says, Peter, put away your sword. Don't you understand, I could call down the angels from heaven and wipe these guys out. At any moment, Jesus could have said the word, called on to God the Father, and wiped them out. But he says, but how would the scriptures be fulfilled? Which means, how would we be obeying God if we're doing our own thing here? Ultimate submission to God, ultimate obedience, ultimate humility. And you pair that with the fact that this is our God. This is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, yet he was in full submission at all times. And as you walk through the the steps of the cross and him going and seeing Pilate, there's so many interesting moments. And some I want to highlight. One is his conversation with Pilate. I, I think that's one of the most fascinating conversations in history. That you've got a Roman governor 
who's trying to work out his land and his people, and he's trying to discern what to do with Jesus. He knows that the Jews are revolting, and that if he doesn't really hammer this guy Jesus, that the Jews will revolt, but it's not in his law to crucify him. So he's caught. And he actually finds a scapegoat and sends him to another ruler, sends him to Herod. Herod sends him back. So he's stuck again. To make matters worse, his wife comes to him and says, I had a, I had a dream about this specific man last night. He is a good man. Don't touch him. So he's got his wife on his case. He's got the other rulers aren't helping him. He's got a revolt about to happen. So he takes Jesus aside. And I want to read to you the conversation that they have. John 19, verses 9 to 11. Pilate took Jesus back into his headquarters again and asked him, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. Why don't you talk to me, Pilate demanded. Don't you realize I have the power to release you or crucify you? Then Jesus said, You would have no power over me at all unless it were given to you from above. So the one who has handed me over to you has the greater sin. Uh, the first time I ever watched The Passion of the Christ, the, the hardest hitting thing for me was actually the fact that Jesus kept silent through all his trials. If at any moment in any of those trials, the, in, in the first Jewish court, they were getting liars to testify and their, their accounts weren't adding up. At any moment, Jesus could have stood up and stood his ground and said, that's a lie and that's not me and I didn't do that and there's no law that says you have to crucify me. You've got nothing on me. He could have defended himself. But the Bible prophesied in Scripture to say he was silent like a lamb before the slaughterer. He kept silent. He had all power, all authority to make his case. He stayed silent. He got to Pilate. He stayed silent. They sent him to Herod. He stayed silent. Herod thought he was crazy. He sent him back to Pilate. And Pilate's demanding... This is one of the highest rulers in the land, has all authority to kill this guy at a word's notice. Can flog him, can beat him. He's begging him, talk to me. Don't you realize, it, by my word, you're released. By my word, you're crucified. What do you want? And he says, I'm not obedient to you. I'm obedient to the Father to stay silent. And, and that authority that you have, it's great and all, but that's actually from the Father. So don't worry about it. And you can, he essentially tells him, you can wash your hands of this and hand me over because it's the sins on their head. And that's exactly what Pilate does. He washes his hands and he gets the Jews to say, this sin is on your head. And they say, we'll take it. So Pilate hands them over. We know that the, the guards beat him and bash him and, and just brutalize him. But you've got to remember, he's, he's, we, we quickly think, yeah, but he's God. He, he's stronger than the average human. He's the average human. We might not be average. He might be the ultimate human. But he's still human. You, you whip someone 39 times, they're going to be beaten down. You're placing a crown of thorns on their head. They're going to be broken down. He was so broken down that he couldn't carry his own cross to the top of the hill. And I put myself in the shoes of Jesus. First of all, if you were to whip me the first time and I knew that there were 39 more to come, I think that would be my breaking point. I'm, I'm not doing this. I'm out. Jesus endured every step. That you place the crown of thorns on my head and, and some Roman guard is smacking me in the face. I'd say, that's it, I'm out. And, and you're gone. He endures it and stays silent. But what I see in Jesus is not only just endurance. On the way to his own death, where he can't even carry his cross because he's so broken down, Women are mourning for him. He turns to those women and says, don't mourn for me. And he begins to prophesy into their life and says, look after your own life and here's what you need to do and begins to uplift them in his darkest hour. I look at other examples that whilst he's on the cross, bleeding and dying for our sins, he forgives the guards who are doing the brutalizing and the murdering. He forgives them. He doesn't just accept it and just bear his cross, he's still ultimately compassionate, ultimately submissive to God. I watch it when he saves the criminal on his side, when the criminal cries out to him and says, can you just remember me? 
And he says, you know what? You will join me in paradise. I watch it in his last words. Where right till his final breath, the Bible describes that his final breath, he releases his spirit to God and says, God, I commend my spirit to you. To his dying breath, he was completely obedient. As a human. Not because he had to, not because some divine order says that's how it had to be. He chose this. He obeyed. He did it. And he became the ultimate man so that we could follow in his footsteps. And not only for that, that we could be saved. He did that for us. He endured it all for us. Because of his love for us, he gave up his divinity and came and died on a cross. But Jesus said himself, those who humble them themselves will be exalted. We read in Philippians that because he humbled himself, because he died a sinner's death on a cross, his name will be the name above all names. Amen? His name will be exalted higher than any other. That at his name, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. It pleased God the Father to crush him. For him to bear our weight, our sin, and for this to happen. It pleased him that Jesus was obedient. And it pleases me because I have a way to heaven. I have a chance in life because of Jesus. If he had decided in his humanity, I'm not doing this. I would have no standing before God at all. I would be on my way to hell. And there's nothing I could argue. There's nothing I could say in the presence of God that could help me. That would be the end of the story. But because Jesus took my sin, I have a chance in front of God. And I watch Jesus' exaltation. I, I, I watch him being lifted higher. And we think that comes on the Sunday. But I want to show you three instances where that happens whilst he's still on the cross, whilst he's still there. And if I could have the worship team come up just as I'm finishing up. Three instances where Jesus' name is lifted high, still on the Friday. If we turn to John chapter 19... Verses 19 to 20. Pilate, this same man who ordered his execution and couldn't figure out who Jesus was and didn't know what to do with him, this same ruler came and nailed a plaque to the top of uh, Jesus' cross. Pilate posted a sign on the cross that read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and the sign was written in Hebrew, Latin and Greek so that many people could read it. This is really interesting. Because here's the ruler of the land calling out to say, I see his royalty. I see this man as a ruler. And he put it in multiple languages so that everyone would know. This is Jesus. He is great. And the Jews came to him and said, can you change it? That he said he was king of the Jews. That It was just semantics. He said, no, no. This is what it is. I've written what I've written. He is king of the Jews. I understand that and I will proclaim that. We see it again in Luke chapter 23. One of the criminals hanging beside Jesus, hanging beside him, scoffed. So you, you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God even when you've been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crime, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied, I assure you today, you'll be with me in paradise. This criminal, on his last breath, sentenced to die, recognized Jesus as Lord. So you've got Pilate in authority recognizing Jesus as Lord. You've got criminals recognizing Jesus as Lord. And finally, in Matthew chapter 27... Jesus' final moment in Jesus' death, he shouted again, he released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart, the tombs were open. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city of Jerusalem and appeared to many people. The Roman officer and the soldiers at the crucifixion 
were terrified by the earthquake and all that happened. They said, this man was truly the son of God. On the Friday, they identified this guy is royalty. This guy is divine. Because he humbled himself unto God, God exalted him in his right place. And we think it was at the resurrection. We think it was in right time. God says, even at this time, people get the glimpse. People can see your divinity. People can see who you really are as the true son of God. This is the God we serve. This is the Jesus that died for us. And I want to finish up here. And I want us all to stand as we go into one more song of worship. I don't have a particular altar call to come down and get prayer. If you need prayer for healing, if you need prayer to get right with God, and you want someone to pray with you, I'll be standing here. Pastor Wayne will be here as well. But I want us to worship as one and say, Jesus, you are the one who gave your life. I want to give my life to you and serve you. I want to be just as humble and just as obedient as you were, as you were to the cross. So let's stand together. Let's be led in worship by our team. And if you need prayer for anything, come down. We'll be happy to pray.
the last recorded words of Jesus are, it is finished. It says when he said it is finished, he's breathed his last. And he died. The Romans, Herod, Pilate, the Pharisees, the high priest, Cyphus, they all thought life can go back on as normal. He's, he's gone, he's done, he's finished with. When Jesus said it is finished, he wasn't talking about his mission. Well, he was, he was talking about his mission. His life was not over. His mission had been fulfilled and the price had been paid for our redemption. Let's leave here today with the knowledge that the price has been paid. I can walk in the fullness and grace that God has for me. For it is finished. I invite you to join us here on Sunday. I have no doubt we'll have a much bigger crowd resurrection Sunday. And we're going to celebrate the risen Saviour. God bless.